I'm Kelly Cleary with Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Cleary with Best Doctors, sorry about that. And I'm on air with uh, Dr. Mimi Kakaska. Mimi, good evening, how are you? Good, thank you, how are you? Very good. Uh, everyone, Dr. Kakaska is Professor and Vice Chair of the Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Department at Indiana University. She earned her medical degree from University of South Southern California, residency at Washington University, and fellowship at St. Louis University. In her current role, Dr. Kokoska is deeply involved in the hospital's efforts to diminish uh, diagnostic errors and improve patient outcomes, and has been instrumental in identifying procedures and standards which improve diagnostic accuracy rates at the hospital. Um, Mimi, we're going to talk tonight about some, uh, some studies, some research that's uh, ongoing in Indianapolis. Can you tell me what your team has been working on and um, the, uh, how it, uh, what you'll be looking at specifically? Sure. We are interested in identifying clinical assessments and decision-making acts of omission that contribute to diagnostic errors and delays in the care and management of patients. We've divided our plan to separately study patients who were ultimately diagnosed with head and neck cancer and those who had non-cancer diagnosis. The reason we're making this dis distinction is because in general, the timeliness of diagnosis is much more critical in patients harboring cancer than those, of course, with benign conditions. Even though we may use the same time period for defining delays, the impact on outcomes and survival will likely have greater significance in patients with cancer. Um, I think that you told me you've added a fifth classification to the four that were listed in the Institute of uh, Medicine's 1999 article to Air is Human. Can you tell me why you uh, further delineated the types of diagnostic error? Sure. The Institute of Medicine report lists four types of diagnostic errors because errors and delays in diagnosis were grouped under one heading of, quote, error or delay in diagnosis, unquote. However, when one is de designing a study to examine factors that contribute to diagnostic inaccuracies, it's important to delineate the two because an error is quite different, of course, from a delay. So an error may or may not contribute to a significant delay, so they're not inter interchangeable. We wanted to ensure that the types of errors measured could also be acted upon in a meaningful manner if they proved to be an issue. So basically in the Institute of Medicine report to errors human, there's a table that lists uh, the types of errors and uh, strat stratified by diagnosis, treatment, preventive, and others. And the four types that were listed, and of course, again, we, we um, took the one of uh, two that was contained under one heading and separated out, so we really have five now. It's error in diagnosis, delay in diagnosis, failure to employ tests or therapy, the use of outmoded tests or therapy, and then, of course, failure to act on the results of monitoring testing. Okay. Um, just, uh, I just had a question uh, that just occurred to me. What, what do you hope, how do you, what do you hope to accomplish by that delineation, um, separating those two out? So, basically, we will be able to, as we comb through data, we'll be able to designate was there an error in diagnosis or was it really a delay? Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, the diagnosis might have been accurate, but it took a much longer time than anticipated or beyond the norm to make that diagnosis, which may have bearing on the outcome or survival of that patient. Okay. Um, Tell me a little bit about the timeline for this research project. Anna, what, what impact do you think that uh, it might have on your, on your health network? So we're hoping that we can learn more about diagnostic accuracy before the end of this calendar year. I believe that this analysis 
will provide us with a guidepost on how we can be better clinicians, teachers, learners, communicators, and translators of information to our patients, their family, and our staff. In addition, the, light, the data will likely challenge us to examine our um, systemic and organizational processes and cognitive abilities as clinicians. The implications will likely be pertinent to healthcare systems beyond our affiliated network here because most clinicians have received their education and experiences through similarly structured medical training programs and uh, their clinical diagnostic education are similar in proportion to di didactic and heuristic lessons and the degree of supervision. Okay, and um, anecdotally, just in your years of practice, how do you, how can you see, what kind of changes do you think that um, this can make and uh, what, are, what were the problems that kind of prompted you to, uh, to look further into this? Well, so I'm in a uh, teaching environment and although not every single encounter is a teaching moment with uh, a trainee or uh, train, uh, MD that's obtaining their specialty training or we have other practitioners that rotate with us, um, nonetheless, uh, intermittently, whether it's within our specialty or outside of my specialty, I do see um, episodes where either there was a failure to diagnose or a error in diagnosis was made or a delayed diagnosis. We've really worked hard over the years to reduce the delay in, delays in terms of patients um, getting their first consult and that in itself will reduce the delay in diagnosis because the sooner a person or a patient can uh, see whether it's primary care or a subspecialist, the more likely that they'll be able to get a diagnosis in a timely manner. So access, of course, uh, contributes to that. So very good. Um, and and I guess this really leads into to my last question. You have been outspoken for many years on the need to uh, document and study instances of diagnostic care in hospitals. Um, how how can physicians open that discussion on diagnostic care in their own health networks? Well, this is a difficult topic to broach in an organization because few clinicians are willing to consider or recognize that there may be gaps which contribute to diagnostic errors. There are ego and reputation considerations, medical legal concerns, and lack of recognition that there may be a problem from management or clinicians. However, fortunately, there are usually enough engaged patient-centric clinicians to partner in the discussions and collaborative efforts. I've been fortunate in that regard. In addition, when we focus the conversation on systems issues, and uh, such as organizational delays or defects, patient factors, electronic barriers, and detection failures of current technologies, clinicians tend to be more receptive to joining in that discussion and then resolving the problem. Another pathway to obtain engagement uh, toward reducing diagnostic delays and errors is to frame the problem under a common goal which may be defined through an institutional collaborative effort or award, grant award, or initiative. Because then you have a team that has that common goal and, um, and usually few heads are better than one anyway. So uh, usually the reductions in diagnostic errors contribute to improved value and cost savings, which should capture the attention of most leaders in management. I would think so. <laughs> yes. So, so back to uh, to your specific um, research that that your team in Indianapolis is working on right now. Any uh, any early findings or any spoilers that you could uh, share with us at all? 
No, we're actually uh, really in a very early phase, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know the study design is so critical. So we right. really are are making sure that that's in place, and also um, we really modified it and edited it and re-edited it, and it's been great because I've had some uh, wonderful colleagues who are quite knowledgeable in clinic clinical informatics and uh, process improvement so involved and and they keep me accountable so I think that so it's really too early to make assumptions I mean I have some personal suspicions but mm -hmm. uh, I want to be data driven so I'm gonna sure. refrain <laughs> any spoilers That's <laughs> That's fair enough. Anna, what ha what have been the um, the reactions of your colleagues uh, when as you've started undertaking this? Well, uh, from the residents, it's I, I think it, they've been receptive and, and quite interested. It's a it's a really a different kind of realm of research than what many are accustomed to, and it's also challenging in many ways because it's forcing us to kind of hold that mirror right to ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, but again if we're focusing on the patient uh, it's it's really a great um, kind of light a guiding light that we're doing the right thing mm -hmm. and hopefully then we can learn and improve the care for and, and, and deliver better care to our patients so I'm just fortunate that I have colleagues that are receptive and have been really collaborative and a pleasure to to um, work with on this effort. Excellent. And of course, we don't want to um, point any fingers uh, at any one specialty, but so, uh, studies do suggest that there are certain um, specialties that are a little more prone to some of this than others. Are you going to be looking um, at this across uh, all the specialties? Are you going to be delineating that at all? Or? Well, so again, uh, so I decided to hold that mirror. And we're looking at this point within our specialty, which is O-laryngology, head, neck, surgery. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps we can uh, extend that to other specialties because I think once you share your own personal um, successes and perhaps gaps or failures it others may be more receptive in doing the same and really again I think we're going to find interesting uh, and multiple points where we can uh, improve care I don't think necessarily it'll be one one um, specific point or one specific action I think there will be many uh, or several actions that we'll take Excellent. Well, um, I think that that is all that I uh, have for the evening. I just want to make sure that I know what I'm doing when I uh, close this thing up, so I'm just checking this. Excellent. Uh, Mimi, any, any parting words? Well, thank you, Kelly, for this opportunity to uh, speak with you again and uh, with Best Doctors. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Great. So we will look forward to uh, hearing from you when when we um, <laughs> when when the results are in. Hope so. Thank All you. All right. Thanks again, Mimi. Have a good evening. You too. Bye. -bye.